Thank you, Sarah, for joining us for this week's Why It Matters. I will let you fire away. Brilliant. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. It's great to, to, you know, to have this chance to speak to you. So my name is Sarah Kuchaya. I'm a lecturer in cyber threats at Swans University's Law School um, and a member of the Multidisciplinary Cyber Threats Research Centre, uh, which uh, is a, a centre which leads uh, on a security strand of another initiative called the Legal Innovation Lab Wales. So I got all of that out of the way. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the research I've been involved with, uh, why it matters and how it has brought me um, along with other colleagues in the law school, but also at Swansea's Computational Foundry to collaborate with two organisations, the Swansea Council for Voluntary Action and South Wales Police, to co-design a framework for victim services, which is fit to meet uh, victims' needs in today's digital world. So this is a project we're calling uh, the Swansea Cyber Clinic, and I'm going to talk you through, I suppose, uh, our journey in, in, in getting to that uh, project. In this presentation, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about the volume and impact of uh, cybercrime, the volume and impact of what I am calling hybrid crime, uh, inspired by uh, other colleagues, I must say, it's not my, it's not my term, I cannot claim it. Um, some of the challenges and opportunities for policing, and finally, how the, the Swansea Cyber Clinic um, is hoping to make a difference. Uh, but firstly, I should really outline what I mean by cyber and hybrid crime so that we know uh, what I am speaking about. So for a while now, we have conceived of cyber crime as either cyber dependent crime, so crimes which primarily target computer systems using other computer systems, and cyber enabled crimes, which are crimes which you know, existed prior to the ICT revolution, but have been significantly transformed, meaning that it's, you know, the volume and the reach of these crimes have, have really increased with the use of ICT. And the prime example of that is fraud. And so this is how we've looked at cybercrime in the past. Um, cyber assisted crime has also been mentioned, but that is generally not uh, considered to be uh, cybercrime. And I've now just somewhat lost control of my slides because of the zoom, uh, uh, the zoom faces, but hopefully I can get it back. Yeah, there we go. So this is this conceptualization of a cyber crime um, doesn't really fit anymore the current situation. You know, with the proliferation of online hate and abuse and disinformation, really is is challenging this idea of, of cyber crime. And this is where uh, the idea of cyber of hybrid crime comes in. So in this context of an increasing, increasingly digital society, it's actually more illuminating to think of crime, which is increasingly hybrid, meaning the online and the offline cannot really meaningfully be separated from each other. Um, and this also extends to the idea of a hybrid victim. So where the victim is not necessarily a single individual or a single organization, but rather a network of uh, uh, human and non-human entities, uh, a cyborg, if you like. So for example, uh, the victim may include an individual, but it may also be a bank. It may also be a tech company. There may be user end systems and sort of uh, tech end, uh, back end systems that are affected. And so for this reason today, I'm, I'm actually gonna give you an overview of, of the volume and the impact of both crimes that I can, you know, that would probably fit the more traditional idea of what cyber crime is, but also uh, I will talk about the volume and impact of hy hybrid crimes. Uh, okay. So first of all, and you know, this picture I'm painting of volume and impact speaks to why this kind of research matters, right? That, that's what I'm getting at here. So firstly, if we consider the volume of, of, of what you know, traditionally has been thought of as cybercrime, what, what you can see in this graph here is, um, uh, is the, the story of crime in England and Wales, if you like. So the, the graph is based on the results of 
the National uh, Representative Survey, the Crime Survey for England and Wales. And it gives you a snapshot of the, the crimes experienced and reported since the 1980s. So you, if you look at the green line, you can see that this shows a decreasing trend in the total um, estimate since the mid 90s. Um, but if you look at the purple line from about um, uh, 2015 onwards, uh, this is much, much higher than the green line. And it shows the effect of the inclusion of computer crimes and fraud in the statistics from 2015. So now that we count these crime types, the total estimate of the crimes that happen uh, in the country is nearly doubled. And this is uh, more what, what uh, it amounts to specifically in the, air, in the year ending in March uh, uh, last year, 4.6 million incidents of fraud, the vast majority of which has an online element and um, uh, uh, 876,000 computer misuse crimes. Okay, so huge volumes. Now, there's also uh, been uh, a lot of coverage of how these crime types have increased during the pandemic. Cyber criminals have always taken advantage of events that attract media attention. And during the pandemic, there has been a huge increase in, in reported cyber crime. So, image there uh, shows you the total number of domains registered per day that contained a COVID related term between January and March last year. Uh, and this is uh, some stats from domain tools. So the red line indicates the count of domains that were determined to be likely malicious. And you can see the, the huge spike there. And you know, in, 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 a, in, in addition to this, you can also look at the stats uh, from domain registry organizations like, um, for example, URID, who looks after the .eu domain, um, or Nominet, who looks after the uh, .uk domain. Uh, and uh, you know they, they've the stats of, of their takedowns have, have really gone through the roof uh, during this period, um, and of course you know cyber criminals. Uh, it, it's not you, it's not just the stats. You you can think uh, we can we can think to the examples of of how crafty they are and how they've adapted to the COVID situation. Uh, and one example of that is you know the growth in in, in pet scams. Now, in terms of the impact, um, while many individuals actually experience no loss or very low levels of loss, the, commun the, cumulative, the cumulative losses associated with these, with these crime types are considerable, and some individuals actually experience pretty devastating losses, as do organizations. So we've got stats from, again, the, the crime survey. You can see there the vast majority of individuals relatively low losses. Uh, but a significant portion experience very high um, uh, direct losses. And the same is true in terms of uh, businesses. And of course, you know, uh, when uh, th th that 1.2 billion pounds that UK finance has said uh, the banks have lost to fraud um, in, in uh, uh, 2020, of course, uh, and we've got the, the stats there from the uh, cyber um, cyber breaches survey that CMS run. And of course, these costs are incurred by businesses. You know, in some cases, businesses will really struggle as a result of these losses. Um, but in any case, often these losses are passed on to individuals uh, as well. So it, it, it also impacts individuals. So huge uh, cumulative financial loss. But the impacts go much beyond uh, financial loss, really, in, 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 in many cases. There are indirect losses that are not accounted for in the statistics. There's um, emotional distress, stress, anxiety, et cetera. Um, often these situations create strained, uh, they, they result in strained relationships between the victim and their families and friends, and often uh, they have also been associated with worsening physical and mental health, uh, and in some extreme cases, actual suicide. Um, now, some of the case studies from my own research also illustrate you know, how direct loss 
doesn't really say much about the impact of some of these crimes on some victims. So there, there's an example of, of a, a case where the financial loss was very, very low. This individual only lost 20 pounds, um, but they were the victim of a romance scam, uh, which lasted uh, over a, a long period of time. And, um, you know, after losing quite a lot of uh, uh, time and, and, and I guess putting a lot of, you know, emotional energy into this relationship, it, it, it turned out to, to be a scam. Um, and the thing is about this, this, uh, this particular case study is that the victim reported six times to the police and uh, even though they, they had a number of devices compromised and they were actually uh, very worried about whether this person who they, you know, they didn't know where this person was, but they were concerned that they may actually know where they live and the, that they were concerned that perhaps they would come around and actually threaten them physically. So, um, you know, it, it can be quite distressing. Um, so, that was the traditional cybercrime, if, if we can call it uh, uh, that these days. But um, as you know, I discussed earlier, in the context of today's digital society, it's been pointed out that this kind of cyber criminology orthodoxy of only thinking about fraud or only thinking about computer misuse crimes is, is, is no longer appropriate. So hybrid crimes, for example, hate crimes, um, have a, a, a very significant digital element, and uh, we've seen recently, you know, for in in the follow uh, in 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 uh, in the period that followed the 2016 referendum, for example, on the UK's membership uh, of the European Union, there was there was a, a disturbing spike in hate crimes, uh, and uh, recently. Uh, the, the phenomenon has kind of made the news again following the racist abuse uh, suffered by the uh, back English footballers during uh, the, the last match of the Euros. Um, so despite all of this, you know, the, the, the National Police Chiefs Council's uh, reports around hate crimes has, has, def has pointed out a number of flaws in the reporting and recording of, of these crime types and the uh, role played by digital technologies. Um, there's also harassment and online abuse, and, and I, I will talk about them together because the difference between harassment and online abuse uh, turns on, on, on the legal definition. Uh, so an instance, one instance of online abuse is just online abuse. In order for it to be harassment, there have to be at least two instances of harassing behavior. So the two things uh, are, are often related to each other. Um, but, you know, there, there's plenty of, of evidence out there, um, particularly of the gendered nature of online abuse and of its consequences on those who face it. Um, recent survey by UNESCO, for example, has looked at uh, 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 how female journalists in particular are targeted by online abuse. And 70% uh, 70% of the women, for example, experienced uh, this kind of abuse online, you know, threat to physical, uh, th physical threats, uh, sexual threats, uh, threats of violence, and 20% and actually said that they, they had been attacked or abused offline in connection with their online violence and you can it's actually a very recently there's been a um, docu documentary on a uh, panorama documentary on the bbc about it for those of you who can who can access that if you want to to know more um, there's also evidence uh, in recent work of coercive control uh, so recent work has, has highlighted how uh, the digital digital technology is being used by perpetrators of uh, intimate partner violence through, you know, uh, blackmailing their partners uh, um, by threatening to share sexual photos, for example, uh, through cyber stalking or doxing or, or even the use of technology as, as, a, as an extent of controlling behavior offline. So, you know, through find your friend type uh, apps on, on, on phones and here the interplay between online and offline uh, behavior is, is very clear as well. 
And more recently, we've had public order offences and, and criminal damage uh, that, that have been associated with disinformation online. So, uh, for example, people breaking COVID rules or, you know, the, the setting fire uh, to 5G towers across the UK in April last year. Uh, similar events in the Netherlands, Belgium, Italy, Cyprus, Australia. Uh, so so all, all of these have been linked to online mis and disinformation. So we can see that, uh, you know, all of these crime types, we can't really uh, say that they were just assisted by technology. Technology plays such a, plays such a fundamental role um, these days in, in some of these crime types that uh, uh, it really is a hybrid of online and, and offline behavior. So in the context of all this, we, we might ask, you know, do victims, do victims really matter to the criminal justice system? And what, what you can see there in that little uh, uh, word cloud I've put together are just some of the initiatives that in the past few years have developed around this idea of putting the victim first or putting the victim at the heart of the criminal justice system. And, you know, they are countless. I'm not going to read them all out. You can see them on the screen. But the reality is that despite all of this, the support that exists for vulnerable and repeat victims still varies widely across England and Wales. It's very inconsistent. It's pretty much luck of the draw whether uh, 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 victims are supported. And for those who, who, for those who report a crime and uh, eventually that makes it to the actual courts, um, uh, the vast majority will say that once they've, you know, vast majority of, of witnesses say that they would not be willing to take part in proceedings again. And of course, again, during the, the pandemic, uh, uh, the, the waiting times uh, have, have really increased. So, uh, you know, very, uh, very few cases actually make it to the courts, uh, but those who do, for the most part, the, the victim experience is, is, is not really a positive one. And there are a lot of challenges, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of difficulty investigating these sorts of crimes. Um, these, these numbers relate to the more traditional cyber crimes, but uh, uh, it, there are similar, similar points could be made about, about other crime types, you know, difficulties in investigation and prosecution around, you know, jurisdiction, anonymity on the internet, et cetera, et cetera, result in, in this kind of attrition through the system. So um, it, it, what you can see in that, in that graph there is a, a picture of of all uh, uh, cybercrime uh, uh, in, in 2015. And you know, out of all of the contacts received by the police, about 61% were actually crimes. And that's normal, you know, there's a lot of things people contact the police about who don't actually meet the threshold of a crime. But what's stark is when you start looking down that pyramid. So out of all that, all of this, out of the 61% that were crimes, only 17 percent, um, uh, uh, you know, through a combination of uh, an algorithmic scoring process and a manual review process that, that is in place, only 17 percent were actually uh, uh, flagged up or disseminated to a police force for investigation. OK, and then you can work your way through through that pyramid and very, very few cases actually make it to the court. But despite this, despite the fact that we know that there are so many challenges in investigating these crime types, the uh, the, the, the criminal justice, the reporting system and, and generally the criminal justice system more generally is still primarily oriented towards this traditional uh, pursue strand of policing, which is all about uh, 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 per, you know, pursuing and punishing the offenders, um, rather than the protect strand, which is more about victim support and, and preventing crime, uh, in the sense of protecting victims, ensuring that victims aren't victimized again and again, for example. Um, and this, you know, uh, is is an area which I, I have looked at in the past in partnership with uh, the Regional Org Organised Crime Unit. We looked at all of the reports in Wales over a period of two years, and we found that about 8% of everything that was reported were, could be attributed to repeat victims. A lot of limitations in this data because the data wasn't uh, designed to identify the repeat victims, but, you know, through 
statistical methods. That 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 was our, our best estimate. It's probably an underestimate. Um, and uh, you know the level of repeat victimization was was higher for computer misuse, as you, as you can see there. Fifteen percent of crimes were reported by six percent of the victims there. Um, but, you know, despite the fact that there is repeat victimization, the vast majority, you know, you could, you could keep contacting the police over and over again. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you will uh, get more of a, of a response at the moment, because the system is not really designed to identify the victims that are being targeted over and over again. Um, so follow, following uh, this, I, you know, uh, I, I did a, um, a secondment through Cherish with South Wales Police, and we tried to identify, you know, some, some of some of the other challenges around policing cyber and hybrid crimes, things like uh, the, the lack of a vision and ownership of the victim response, the difficulties in meeting uh, victims' heterogeneous needs. Um, the need to coordinate multiple stakeholders because, you know, vic supporting victims, okay, the police plays a role in that, but there are many other organizations that, that play a role in that. So there's a need for a lot of coordination and, and information sharing to happen. And of course, the underdevelopment of legislation uh, to address emerging threats like online abuse and disinformation, uh, but also victims' rights uh, legislation is fairly underdeveloped. Uh, so I'm conscious of the time, actually. So we've identified that, you know, we need to move away from the cyber orthodoxy. There's a need to re rebalance, pursue and protect. So away from the traditional pursue idea of policing more towards the prevention side. Uh, but, and there's a need to really have, just have a victim support strategy, which is fit for the digital world. The organizations that are supporting victims are not necessarily ready to deal with the digital elements of, of victimization and ultimately legislative reform. Uh, but importantly, we need to be listening to practitioners in victims a lot more. And that is something that is missing. You know, we've looked at this data in, in the, the administrative data. There are the, the, the large surveys like the crime survey, um, but we need to do a lot more of actually listening to victims and practitioners, finding out what their needs are and responding accordingly, which is where the Swansea Cyber Clinic comes in. Uh, so we, we've got uh, 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 a little bit of uh, funding to run this, this pilot, uh, which aims to develop a, a, a clinic uh, in, in, in South Wales. So the idea is we're going to speak to practitioners, we're going to speak to victims, and we're going to co-design a, a framework for victim support in the local area, which will include a mix of face-to-face -face and, and, and digital support. And you can see there the, the, the research team is uh, myself without any hair, because it, that photo is pre pre-COVID, uh, myself and, uh, and uh, Nena, which you see uh, uh, in the middle of the picture, a colleague from, from the law school and then some colleagues from the computational foundry as well, uh, Lee, Clark, Lee Clark, uh, uh, uh Stuart Nich Nicholson at, uh, uh, at the end there, and, and we've got Martin uh, there with a photo of him in, on a hike. Uh, so, so we're really looking forward to getting started with this. Uh, as I said in, in the beginning, it's a partnership with uh, C, uh, CSCVS, who are a membership organization. They represent about over 200 charities in, in the Swansea area, a lot of whom are supporting victims in different ways, South Wales Police, and of course, law and computer science in, in Swansea. And we're, we're, we're just uh, about to, to, to kick off with some uh, focus groups. We're we're sort of we're using a, a mixed methods approach in a sense. We're using some of the traditional focus groups based and, and interview based approaches from social sciences, and then we're we're using some some uh, the, the co design uh, uh, methodology, uh, which the colleagues from computer science are are, are uh, 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 very experienced at, and we hope uh, to to come up with a framework that actually works. For victims and, and particularly repeat victims will not be uh, uh, you know left without any support just because there are no investigative leads in, in their case. So that is it from me. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions.